Hello, welcome to another Pressing Issues. Today we're going to be talking about something that's come up quite often recently, and that is the idea that as Seventh-day Adventists, we shouldn't name names of other individuals, leaders, ministers, preachers, or whoever, uh, who are teaching false doctrines. And today we're going to study that out in depth. We're going to look to see if that is a biblical thing, if it's, if it's something that, that is... is uh, supported by the Bible to not name names. Also, we're going to see in the spirit of prophecy, if it's supported by the spirit of prophecy, to not name names. And also, we're going to look at just a few historical examples as well thrown in. And we'll be getting, of course, Pastor Hugh's commentary and his extensive history with this particular issue, because this issue has come up a lot for him in his career, because he has been so outspoken about the apostasy in the church. So before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we ask for your ministering spirits to be here with us today. We ask for your Holy Spirit to be with here, here with us today, Lord. We need your strength of wisdom. We need wisdom from on high, Lord, to see, to discern truth and error. Amen. Help us as we study this, this issue, this subject of naming names. Is it biblical? Is it supported by the spirit of prophecy? Our goal here, Lord, is not, is not to try to twist the scriptures or the spirit of prophecy to say what we would have it say. But, Lord, our, our goal is to find the truth unadulterated as it is in Jesus and to, to have that truth shine forth beyond all, anything else, any false doctrine that's out there, that it would light those things up. Sure. And help us to give us clearer vision as we move forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, Pastor Hughes, first question. Is it wrong to name drop other preachers, leaders, etc.? If so, when is it okay and when is it not okay? Well, Cody, the first question you asked, is it wrong to name drop other preachers? We as Seventh-day Adventists, we name drop all the time. All the time. When we name drop, we typically name drop people in the past that have done wrong, right. be it... Let's say, for example, when we're talking about the rise of secret societies and we're looking, uh, for example, at the Illuminati, we will say, well, you know, the founder of that wicked, sinister, evil system was Adam Weishaupt. Have we just dropped a name? Well, of course we have. Exactly. We, we've named a name. If, if we're talking about... Um, the, the Pope that uh, signed the Concordat with Mussolini to begin the restoration of the deadly wound in 1929. We say, well, you know, that was, that was Pope Pius XI. Do we have a problem with that? Uh, who was the man who, who we have been told killed John F. Kennedy? Well, we've always been told that was Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, who killed Lincoln? Well, that was John Wilkes Booth. So we name drop all the time. We name names. That, that's just, that's what you do to identify uh, a sinister act, a sinister actor, uh, a trend in history. Uh, we constantly are dropping names to attach to those particular events. The problem I see, Cody, is that where it ceases to be okay is when we look at current people that are living that are involved and entwined 
in sinister or wicked or evil uh, plans, uh, a clandestine uh, movement to destroy, and we name a name. And I'll give an example, 2001, when we talk about the bringing in of spiritual formation into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Well, that was done by a, a committee of primarily vice presidents within the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. One of the men on that committee that brought in this most evil and wicked and awful thing into Seventh-day Adventism was Ted Wilson. See now, if we just simply say, well, it was brought into Adventism in 2001, but we don't show how it applies directly to us today, if we don't show that, People can say, okay, it came in, but they can't see it and they can't attribute anybody to it and so it's okay and they just throw it off. But when you attach a name to it, somebody that's alive, somebody that is still promoting wicked things that are destroying God's professed people, then there's a problem. So, is name calling okay? Well, we've been doing it for decades. Ellen White calls people by name in, in her books and the great controversy, be it for good or for evil. Uh, she does that, the Bible does that. So I, th I personally believe, Cody, the great issue is, is that as long as you leave it in history, in the past, it's okay. But when you bring it to now and make it a current, present situation, then there's a problem. And that's what I believe. Right. So it, basically what I hear you saying is that we have to name drop because we're not giving a complete message and if we don't. And with the issue, just to just go back to what you're saying with Ted Wilson. Ted Wilson is a person who happens to be the general conference president right now. And so he has, he has sermons and talks that you can point back to where he says, stay away from spiritual formation. Right? So if we take that, those words, which are solid, it's, it's good to say to stay away from spiritual formation. But when you take that and then you look at where spiritual formation entered into the Seventh-day Adventist Church and that he was on the board of directors that voted to have spiritual formation added to the curriculum at all the Seventh-day Adventist universities, well, then now you can see that the man is actually talking out of both sides of his mouth because his actions don't match his words. And that's really one of the key problems with so many Seventh-day Adventists is that their actions do not match their words. And so if we don't connect the two together, again, just sticking with Ted Wilson, there's a lot of other people that are coming to my mind right now. I'm just going to stick with Ted Wilson for this. If, if you don't know that Ted Wilson is the reason why spiritual formation is in the church, then you make the mistake of thinking because of the sermons and talks that he's given about condemning spiritual formation, you think that your enemy is your ally. So it's very, very important that when sins are done in public, especially when they're done in a public manner, that they are addressed in public. And the Bible gives a couple examples on this. I have a few verses here. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 10. And then verse 14, the Apostle Paul, he's one of probably the mo one of the most notorious ones, if you will, for name dropping. He says in verse 10 of 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and departed unto Thessalonica. 
uh, Cretans to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. So he's talking about a Christian, so this is within the church. He's name dropping, and he's also doing it in an inspired letter, which would be published for the entire uh, generation of every generation. So he's doing much more of a name drop even than we would, because it's living in the annals of history for all of eternity. Also, verse 14, he says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Then we also have 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 20. It's another example. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 20 says, Them that sin rebuke before all that others, may also, that others also may fear. So sins, again, addressed in public must be dealt with in public. You also have the example, we won't go there necessarily because of time, but you have the example in Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 15, uh, where the Apostle Paul talks about how he rebuked Peter to his face in front of everyone, uh, even any Gentiles that happened to be there. And he did this, and then again, he wrote about it and immortalized it in his letter to the Galatians. So he did much more than name drop. And then maybe one of the most powerful statements, I think, on this is from Romans. Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. And this will fit perfectly with what we've said about Ted Wilson. Romans chapter 16 and verse 17 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. So we're actually supposed to mark them. To mark someone is to highlight them, to point them out, in other words. So what Ted Wilson is doing, Ted Wilson uh, is causing divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine of God by implementing spiritual formation. So we mark him and say, this is a deceiver. And the folks who get upset about that, they'll use many... They'll use many uh, rebuttals against this, as in, you shouldn't, you shouldn't say things that are going to go over the airways that people who are outside of the church don't hear. Uh, another one is that you shouldn't touch the Lord's anointed. All these things are not applicable to people who are in blatant error and who are teaching false doctrines. Now, if they're teaching a doctrine like, like uh, the 144,000 is a spiritual number versus somebody who says, no, the 144,000 is a literal number. That's not the doctrines we're talking about. But when it's, we're talking about messages like righteousness by faith, which Walter Weith teaches a false message on white righteousness by faith, that's a salvational issue. And the fact of the matter is the people that pet Walter and, and tell him that everything that he does is perfect and he never does anything wrong, and they don't, they're unwilling to rebuke him, uh, if he continues in that doctrine of saved in sin and he's ultimately lost, when he's standing outside of the city gates looking in, right before the, the, the lake of fire is about to be kindled, I'm not saying that's what's going to happen to him, but if, if he continues in the saved in sin doctrine, it will. When he's out there looking in, about to be destroyed because of a false doctrine that he held to, he is not going to be thankful for all of the people that did not try to rebuke and warn him. He's going to be thankful for the people that, tried to, that loved him enough to warn him. So Pastor Hughes, myself, we have no personal qualms, no personal issues with Walter, no personal issues with Ted Wilson, no personal issues with Doug Batchelor or Stephen Bohr or uh, Ivor Myers or any other, Steve Wolberg, any other names you want to throw in there. We have no personal issues with them. They're probably very nice people if you were to talk to them and meet with them. Sure. The problem is, is that they're all teaching watered down messages, false messages, salvationally false messages in one form or another. And not talking about the apostasy going on in the church, telling people that they have to stay in the church in order to be saved, that is in the denomination, not in what the Bible considers to be the church, which is the true body of believers. When they're doing those things, they're preaching false doctrines false messages, and they have to be pointed out. And someone has to love them enough to point out those and rebuke them and point out those flaws in their messages so that they can either fix them or reveal themselves to be a true enemy of God. The choice is theirs. But it is the duty of the watchmen on the walls of Zion 
to rebuke and reprove when he sees errors coming into the camp. Go back for a minute. If, if people did not have the knowledge and did not associate Ted Wilson with the committee in 2001 that brought spiritual formation into the Seventh-day Adventist Church that is destroying this denomination. Yeah. When he became the president in 2010 and mentioned in his opening sermon about the three angels' messages over and over and over and over again and talked about the circulation of the book, The Great Controversy, as, as the, the goal of his presidency. Right. I mean, people that didn't know that he was part of that committee in 2001, I had people all over the world writing to me and calling me and saying, this could be a modern day Josiah. This guy could bring re reformation to the Adventist movement. But then you go back and you learn, oh, but he was a part of that committee in 2001. Right. So he can talk about stay away from spiritual formation, but he's the one who brought it into Seventh-day Adventism. And then after that, if you don't associate him to that, you're starting to say, oh, this is a good guy. He wants to promote the great controversy. Uh, he wants to promote the three angels' messages. Well, so then people dump millions of dollars. Right. Hey, this guy's trustworthy. Let's get behind him. Millions of dollars are, are sent in for the Great Controversy Project. And what did they get? They got a slap in the face. Why? Because they didn't know that he was associated with 2001. Right. Because it wasn't right to name drop and associate him with being on that committee. Right. So, but if people had known, they would have said, well, let's watch and see what we're going to get in this great controversy project. Right. In 2010, right after his sermon in Atlanta, in that autumn council, he gave a sermon called Remember Your Name, in which he called on like eight or nine different groups of Seventh-day Adventists, and he told them to come back to the church. One of the groups he told were self-supporting ministries. He said, come back into the church. Tell your supporters to stop supporting you, that they ought to put their money back into the church. And you need to start a nice, warm relationship with a local conference pastor. If we didn't know that he was connected to 2001, we pour our money into the great controversy and we get the great hoax. We dissolve independent ministries that are doing the true work of God and we tell our supporters to go support the denomination, to make sure you fund Gwinoon Diop as he goes all over the world in the name of ecumenism. Right which is a plague to this church. It's a plague, Cody. So, folks, don't, don't, don't we see the domino effect? If you don't name a name in 2001, the sermon's great in 2010, we get the great hoax instead of the great controversy, and millions of dollars are dumped into this devotional book where the great controversy is destroyed. And then in 2014, what do we get at the ASI meeting in Grand Rapids, Michigan? In commenting on the three angels' messages, Ted Wilson says, you know, the mark of the beast is any day of the week other than the seventh-day Sabbath. What, what is this? Well, friends, if, if we haven't name dropped all these things, by the time we get to Grand Rapids in 2014, we got people all over Adventism justifying what Ted Wilson said, yeah. saying, oh, that's okay. 
Well, like when I wrote to Doug Batzer and I said, come on, Doug, stand up, show some courage, and demand that Ted Wilson tell the Adventist people what the mark of the beast is. And Doug writes back to me and says, oh, I agree with Ted Wilson. What? Yeah. So, folk, if, if we don't name drop, if we don't rebuke sin and we don't rebuke the people that are, are fostering these evils and these false teachings, if we don't name drop, nobody knows who's doing it. No. Nobody knows. And you don't associate them with it and you think everything's fine. Everything's wonderful. And you know, the thing, the thing about that is too, Pastor Hughes, is we're not judging their character when we do that either. We're just connecting them to the false doctrine. Because here's the thing. Ted Wilson, if you stack all the chips, if you, if you look at his resume as to all the things that he's done that has been detrimental to the message, it's a real hard case to say that he's a well-meaning Christian that just keeps accidentally fumbling the ball here. Really, it does. But even if we're going to say that, at least what you can see when you know all the things that he's done is that he's at minimum incompetent and has no business being in the position that he's in. And the problem is, is that, like we were saying, you might see an enemy as an ally and pour money into it. I thought of uh, an equivalent thing, which would be like, you, you actually end up, in a sense, seeking to weed out sin with Satan, teaming up with Satan to weed out sin. That's essentially what's happening when you ally yourself with someone who's against the message to try to promote the message. They're going to undermine it. Plain and simple. When nothing is done to deal with the problem, the problem only snowballs and gets worse and worse and worse. Till finally it's so massive that anybody that has stood with that person, they're going to get bowled right over. Yeah. And, and we see that during COVID. During COVID-19, where did Ted Wilson and the General Conference stand? Did they stand in support of Seventh-day Adventists who wanted to maintain their health and maintain their convictions that their body was the temple of God? Did Ted Wilson stand on the side of humble, Bible-believing Seventh-day Adventists? Did he or did he not, friends? What position did he take? Well, since I haven't heard anybody give me an answer, I, I know you can't because you're watching. Ted Wilson did not support a single Seventh-day Adventist. The General Conference did not defend a single Seventh-day Adventist who wanted to maintain fundamental health laws because they believe their body is the temple of God. They didn't support them at all. Ted Wilson went hook, line, and sinker with the agenda of Anthony Fauci and the NIH and the CDC. That was the position of Ted Wilson. Exactly. And so, naming names, the more we need, what we need actually is more people to name names so that the, the message is published far and wide so that people are more informed. That's what we want people to do. At the end of the day, you have to make your decision about where you're going to stand with God, where you're going to stand with truth. Um, but we want you to have an informed decision when you make that decision. Absolutely. So, number two, question two, and I have a few examples to read off here, and then I'll get your commentary, Pastor Hughes. Is it hateful or loving to rebuke people by name? And then we have some Bible and spirit of uh, prophecy examples. Uh, the Bible, Old Testament, you have Phineas. Uh, he 
rebuked Zimri in a, the most lethal way possible for taking a Moabite woman into the tent with him. Actually, he plunged his spear through them, and God says that he made atonement at that time. Numbers chapter 25. Achan was called out by name before the entire congregation in Joshua chapter 7. Korah, Dathan, and Abiram in Numbers 16. Samuel rebuked Saul by name in public for whoever's eyes to see, uh, even enemy prisoners who he had taken. Uh, Nathan rebuked David by name. The man of God rebuked Jeroboam in public in the presence of believers and idol worshipers. Rehoboam was rebuked by Shemaiah. Elijah rebuked Ahab and Jezebel by name in front of all present. It didn't matter who was there. Elisha did the same. There's a lot more. But in the New Testament, we have uh, John the Baptist called the Pharisee is a generation of vipers to their face in front of all present, including Roman soldiers who were there. He said it so specific people, uh, two specific people constituting a direct rebuke to a specific person. Uh, seekers, non-believers, and believers were all present. John the Baptist also named names when he rebuked Herod in front of all. Actually, this eventually got him killed, uh, which certainly included Jewish and Roman leaders because they made up his court, uh, by which he was imprisoned and later executed. You have the examples I've given previously, Alexander the Cop Coppersmith, but also you have uh, Euodia and Syntyche, a, a dispute between two women in Philippians chapter 4, and then Paul to Peter again in Galatians chapter 2. When we get to the spirit of prophecy, I have two pieces of evidence here. Number one, from the book Prayer, page 207. It says, I have received letters questioning me in regard to the proper attitude to be taken by a person offering prayer to the sovereign of the universe. Where have our brethren obtained the idea that they should stand upon their feet when praying to God? One who has been educated about five years in Battle Creek was asked to read, to lead in prayer before Sister White should speak to the people. But as I beheld him standing upright upon his feet while his lips were about to open in prayer to, to God, my soul was stirred within me to give him an open rebuke. Calling him by name, I said, get down upon your knees. This is the proper position always. Another example, testimonies on sexual behavior, adultery, and divorce, page 202. A public reproof, it's called, uh, written to a young unmarried minister. We have some hard labor to do here. There was a spirit of lightness on the ground. The young men were mating or pairing up uh, with young girls. And when reproved, some were some of them defiant, hard-hearted, reckless. We had to get this cleared away before we could get the spirit of freedom in our meeting. But Sabbath, everything seemed to break away. Elder Y, who had been preaching, has been running after the girls, married women, and widows, and this seemed to be his inclination out of the desk from, the state, to, from state to state. Sunday, morn, Sunday morning, I called him out by name and told him, and all present, we had no use for any such men, for they would only make the work of burden-bearing labors double what it is now. So clearly, uh, there are times to rebuke people in public, and that's when they were doing things that are in public. But the question remains, Pastor Hughes, is it hateful or loving to rebuke people by name? It's the most loving thing you can do. Because you see a person teaching, in our cases, Cody, we see false teaching being promoted, whether it be spiritual formation, whether it be the destruction of the great controversy, whether it be the, the destruction of what the mark of the beast is. We see the idea that you can be saved in your sins that will always be Laodicean. Right. The, these, are, these are pillar doctrines of Seventh-day Adventism, pillars of the faith that are under assault by, quote-unquote, the professed people of God, the leaders, whether it be Ted Wilson, Walter, by Doug Batchelor, or whoever it is. These are, these are core doctrines, Cody, that are being assaulted, and we are rebuking them because we love them and we're warning them to stop doing that because they're destroying themselves and they're destroying other people. 
What Ellen White's talking about here, she's dealing with people on a personal level. But the principle is the same. What these people were doing in a personal way, especially this young unmarried minister, in a very personal way, this man's life and Elder Wise's life were destroying the truth of God. And Ellen White rebuked them by name because their behavior was destroying God's truth. It's the most loving thing you can do. To, to see somebody about to jump off a cliff and say, go ahead. That's fine. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. <laughs> you know, everything will be okay. That, that's the most hateful, cruel thing you could do. Absolutely. And I think a lot of people, especially here in the Western world, have such a very thin skin about this stuff. I mean, you think, you think about Jesus calling, calling the, uh, the Pharisees whited sepulchers, you know, full of, full of dead men's bones, and some of the things that he had said to them, of course, which they didn't take well either. But I feel like in the Western civilization, we, we've, we've gone towards this, this mode of political correctness so much that it is, our, our skin is so thin when it comes to this stuff that if something is even perceived to be slightly harsh, the whole message is, is like, oh, you shouldn't have said that. It's not what you said. It's the way you said it. It's what you hear people say <laughs> all the time. But the fact of the matter is, is if you're in a, if you're in a house that's on fire, or better yet, let's, let's, since, we, since we're, at, we're in a spiritual war, let's take it to the war. Let's say you're in the trenches in the war. And somebody has their head sticking up out of the trench. What's going to happen when their head is sticking up above the trench? Blown away. It's going to get blown away. If somebody comes up to you and says, hey, you should, you should get down because you could get shot in the head. Or if somebody says to you, hey, moron, get your head down. Which person, which person didn't save that person's life? They both did. And actually, the person who said it more... Uh, fiercely, yeah, there was a contained uh, 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 some verbiage there. I'm not necessarily I'm not recommending we call people names, but the point I'm trying to make is, is that the person who yelled at them and told them to get down brought the message home to them much stronger than the person who softly petted them. They might have thought about it for a couple of seconds. Those couple of seconds may have cost them their life. Mm -hmm. So. It brings me to Ezekiel chapter 33, Ezekiel chapter 33, and I want to read verses, I wrote it down here, verse 2 through 6. Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 2 through 6, it makes it so clear for what our position and job is to be as a watchman on the walls of Zion. It says, Son of man, speak to the children of, the, of thy people and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon the land, if the people of the land take a man of their coasts and set him for their watchman, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning, his blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. And then verse 6 it says, But if the watchman see the sword come, now this could be a spiritual sword as well, a false doctrine. If the watchmen see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, the people be not warned. And if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his, iniqu in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. You see, if we don't name names, if we don't say, talk about the apostasy going on in the church, if we preach the message that so many people would like us to preach in the way that they would like us to preach it, we would have to compromise the Word of God and not and, and derelict our duty to be a true watchman on the wall, which will blow the trumpet regardless of who it is, no matter, what, no matter how prestigious the person is. If they're teaching false doctrines, if they're watering down the messages, we're going to point them out. Sorry. And it's not a personal thing. It's a loving thing. Absolutely, Cody. So our next question is, 
what is the proper meaning and application of Matthew 18? Because so many folks will say, you'll say something about Ted Wilson or Diop, uh, Vith or Bachelor, and they'll say, did you Matthew 18 him? And so can you help us to understand what, what does Matthew 18 really mean? Matthew 18 has absolutely nothing to do with somebody who is publicly promoting false teaching. Matthew 18 has nothing to do with people in positions where they are publicly declaring wrong doctrine. Matthew 18 has everything to do if somebody tripped you on the way to getting a drink of water, or I deliberately punched you in the stomach in the lunch line today because I wanted the last piece of bread. Right. If I have a personal grievance against you or you against me, then we go and discuss it with that person. That's what Matthew 18 is all about. It's about personal grievance. It has nothing to do with public teaching of false doctrine. Right, so if you had, if you had a personal problem with uh, Paul Prano, for instance, and I'll just use this as an example, because you wanted to cook food, and Paul said, no, you don't know how to cook. I'm sorry, I'm not going to let you cook on the Sabbath. For, to, to finish up with the heating up of the food that we have. And you say, no, I really want to do it. And he says, no, you're not doing it. And you got upset with him about that. And you started to tell people, you know, Paul Prano, he's, he's, uh, he's a bad guy because uh, he's, uh, he's too harsh and he's too mean. And, he's, and you tell a number of people this. Um, it would be totally permissible for the person hearing that to say, did you Matthew 18 this? Course. Because you have a personal problem with Paul over something that is clearly has not been laid to rest, and you would have to go to him and work that out. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's the true application of Matthew 18. And actually, we have a, a great example here from the Spirit of Prophecy. This is from Testimonies of the Church, uh, Volume 2, page 14 and 15. It says, Sabbath my husband spoke in the forenoon. And I followed for two hours before taking food. The meeting was then closed for a few moments, and I took a little food, and afterwards spoke in a social meeting for one hour, bearing pointed testimonies for several present. These testimonies were generally received with feelings of humility and gratitude. I cannot, however, say that all were so received. What that means, folks, is that she, pointed, she called out people by name at that point. So that's what and, she's talking about. And some appreciated it. Right. Some, and some didn't. Some accepted it, accepted the rebuke with humility and gratitude. But others, she says, did not. And then she goes on. The next morning, as we were about to leave for the house for worship to engage in the arduous labors of the day, a sister from whom I had a testimony that she lacked discretion and caution and did not fully control her words and actions, came in with her husband and manifested feelings of unreconciliation and agitation. She commenced to talk and to weep. She murmured a little and confessed a little and justified self considerably. She had a wrong idea of many things I had stated to her. Her pride was touched as I brought out her faults in so public a manner. Here was evidently the main difficulty. But why should she feel thus? The brethren and sister knew these things were so. Therefore, it, I was not informing them of anything new. <laughs> See, it was in, only in her mind that these things were hidden. But I doubt not that it was new to the sister herself. She did not know herself and could not properly judge her own words and acts. This is, the degree, this is in a degree true of nearly all. Hence the necessity of faithful reproofs in the church and the cultivation by all its members of love for the plain testimony. Wow, huge principle laid out there. Yes, sir. Huge principle. We should all love the truth enough to be able to reprove each other. Wow. She goes on. Her husband seemed to feel unreconciled to my bringing out her faults before the church and stated that if Sister White had followed the directions of our Lord, 
In Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17, he should not have felt hurt. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell them his fault between thee and him alone. And if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained a brother. But if he, he will not hear thee, hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. My husband then stated that he should understand that these words of our Lord had reference to cases of personal trespass and could not be applied to the case of the sister. She had not trespassed against Sister White, but that which had been reproved publicly was public wrongs which threatened the prosperity of the church and the cause. Here, said my husband, this is a text applicable to this case. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 20. Them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. Very clear there. That's the true understanding of Matthew chapter 18. Did you notice where James White said, it has to be reproved publicly when it threatens the prosperity of the church and the cause. Absolutely. Is the cause of God threatened if somebody is promoting a devotional great hoax and trashing the great controversy? Absolutely. Absolutely. Should it be reproved openly and publicly? Absolutely. Absolutely. When someone is teaching saved in sin in the, in, on the borders of the promised land when we are supposed to be teaching the messages of righteousness by faith, is that, is that at variance with the cause of God? Absolutely. 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 If you have ministers who, like the Bible says, are dumb dogs that won't bark, that won't talk about the apostasy going on in the church, should that be reproved? Is that, is that a, a, a problem for the cause of God? Absolutely. 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 So now we understand when the cause of God is on the line and sins are done in public, they are to be rebuked in public so that the cause of God, the ship, might be corrected to proper course. I remember, Cody, almost 30 years ago, William Johnson, the editor of the Adventist Review, put an insert in the Review and Herald, it was called Saints' Victory at the End of Time, and it was looking at Revelation chapter 12 through Revelation chapter 18. And as he's commenting on these passages in the book of Revelation, he says, he comes to the first beast of Revelation 13, and he says, to interpret the first beast of Revelation 13 as the papacy is it smacks of narrowness and bigotry. And he said anybody that believes that is a narrow is is narrow-minded right. and a bigot. And so I get up the next Sabbath and I show what he writes in the review on TV and I say Folk, this man's, this is heresy. This is bold-faced apostasy coming from the Adventist Review. And I had people write to me and say, did you Matthew 18 him? It doesn't apply. You it, don't know him. It, ha it has no application whatsoever. So what I did, I said, fine, I'll, I'll write Bill Johnson a letter. I wrote right. him a letter. You are on the side of the people. That's why you did that. You didn't have to do that. Right. So just let's make it clear. He didn't have to do that. He was just doing that for the benefit of the people. I've done the same thing with Walter. Yeah. So. I write him a letter. I say, what are, you, what are you doing? Why are you teaching this falsehood? Every time Ellen White discusses the first beast of Revelation 13, she applies it to the papacy. And now you're saying that Ellen White and the Holy Spirit that inspired her are narrow-minded bigots? What are you doing? And guess what William Johnson wrote back to me? Nothing. He never wrote back to me. 
Walter never wrote me back when, when through the prodding of the people, they told me to contact him about the saved and sin issue after I did the radio programs. And I, too, heard nothing back from him. So, but again... But I still don't have any personal issues with Walter. Of course. Or you with William Johnson. No. But that which is going to threaten the prosperity of the church, that will be rebuked. And it will be done by naming names to warn the person who did it, plus the people that listen to them, that you better watch out what you're hearing. And we're putting you on notice as well. Right, exactly. So number four, can you comment and respond to the spirit of prophecy quote then? This is from Testimonies of the Church, volume three, page 93. I'm not gonna read necessarily the whole thing, but I have a few sections here I'll read. It says, frequently the truth and facts are to be plainly spoken to the erring, to make them see and feel their error, that they may reform. But this should ever be done with pitying tenderness, not with harshness or severity, but considering one's own weakness, lest he also be tempted. When, one, when the one at fault sees and acknowledges his error, then instead of grieving him and seeking to make him feel more deeply, comfort should be given. In the Sermon of Christ upon the Mount, he said, Judge not that ye be not judged. For what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Our Savior reproved, our Savior reproved for rash judgment. Why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? It is frequently the case that while one is quick to discern the errors of his brethren, he may, have, he may be in greater faults himself, but be blind to them. All who are followers of Christ should deal with one another exactly as we wish the Lord to deal with us in our errors and weaknesses, for we are erring and need his pitying forgiveness. Jesus consented to take human nature that he might know how to pity, and how to plead with his Father in behalf of sinful, erring mortals. He volunteered to become man's advocate, and he humiliated himself to become acquainted with the temptations wherewith man is beset, that he might succor them, uh, sorry, sorry, succor those who should be tempted and be a tender and faithful high priest. Frequently, there is a necessity for rebuking and reproving wrong, sorry, rebuking sin, and reproving wrong, but ministers who are working for the salvation of their fellow men should not be pitiless toward the errors of one another, nor make prominent the defects in their organizations. They should not expose or reproof their weaknesses. They should inquire if such a course pursued by another toward themselves would bring about the desired effect. Would it increase their love for and confidence in the one who has thus made prominent their mistakes? Especially should the mistakes of ministers who are engaged in the work of God be kept within as small a circle as possible, for there are many who seek, there are many weak ones who will take advantage if they are aware that those who minister in word and doctrine have weaknesses like other men. And it is a most cruel thing for the faults of a minister to be exposed to unbelievers if that minister is counted worthy to labor in the future, for the future for the salvation of, of souls." No good can come of this exposure, but only harm. The Lord frowns upon this course, for it is undermining the confidence of the people and those whom he accepts to carry forward his work. The character of every fellow laborer should be jealously guarded by brother ministers. Uh, and I'll stop right there. It just goes on a little bit from there. But can you comment on that? Should we keep it in as small a circle as possible? Should we... Um, um, What's, it, what's she actually saying here? Is she saying, don't reprove sin in the church? Is that what she's saying? Or is she saying something else? I don't believe, Cody, she is referring to uh, not rebuking sin in the church because that goes contrary to everything else we have already read from Ellen White in regards to rebuking others and the fact that she did it herself. Right, and so that passage needs to be understood in the light of the other passages as well. Absolutely. That's a good point. Uh, Cody, my, my understanding of this passage is, is that number one, uh, again, if, if there's a problem, 
If there is a, prob a personal problem, we go to the person, we talk to the person, we plead with the person uh, because we want their best interest. So, and there's no doubt about that. The, the concept here about we don't want to be harsh, you know, or, oh, it's not what you said, it's how you say it. Right. Cody, I've heard that so many times from people. And it's like, a, it's like a, 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 an ace card, they feel, that they can just throw down at any time and tell you to shut up, because that's really what they're telling you to do. They just don't want the rebuke. And they, the rebuke is, is either harming their idol or it's harming them. And so they don't want you to say it. And so a lot of times what they'll say is it's not what you said, but how you, you said it. it. Yeah. And this is what Mrs. White's talking about, I think, a little bit in here. Is she's saying don't be pitiless about it. You know, when you reprove someone for being wrong, you don't bring it up all the time after the fact. You don't keep beating them down and try to force them to feel more. You see, when we talk about Doug Batchelor, Walter Bythe, uh, Steve Wahlberg, Pastor Ivor Myers, when we talk about Ted Wilson and Grenoon Diop, we don't touch their character. We don't touch their motives. But it seems like folks will take passages like these and they'll try to attribute motive to us to say that what we're trying to do is, is beat them down and hurt them in a cruel manner, and that's not the case. The fact of the matter is, the person who speaks it is choosing the circle, the smallest possible circle, upon which it has to be dealt with. You see, because if Pastor, if Pastor Walter Bythe is teaching uh, his saved in sin doctrine in a private Bible study, we're never going to know about that, so we can't comment on it. So when Mrs. White says that, that it should be dealt with in as small a circle as possible, well, how small of a circle is it when you post something on YouTube? <laughs> the circle is now the world, the entire world. Sure. So when it's broadcast in that way, and the damage is being done in that way, then the recompense, the reproof, has to be just as far-reaching. And let me tell you, folks, that is the smallest possible circle that you can deal with. When someone says something, even if they're in the church, and a camera is rolling, and it is then posted on social media of some kind, YouTube, Rumble, BitChute, Brighteon, any of these platforms, you have now made the smallest circle the entire earth. True. And so this, we deal with it within the smallest circle as well. Absolutely, we will. Absolutely. You know, to words to, to, to your point about the... Um, the issue with, it's not what you said, it's how you said it. I have another quote here from Testimonies of the Church, Volume 1. Mrs. White is defending her husband, James White, for reproving sin in the church. It's a section called cutting and slashing. It says, cutting and slashing. This expression is often used to represent the manners and words of persons who reprove those who are under or who are wrong or supposed to be wrong. It is properly applied to those who have no duty to reprove their brethren yet are ready to engage in this work in a rash and unsparing manner. It is import, improperly applied to those who have a special duty to do in reproving wrongs in the church. Such have the burden of the work and feel compelled from a love of precious souls to deal faithfully. From time to time, for the past 20 years, I have been shown that the Lord had qualified my husband for the work of faithfully dealing with the erring, and had laid the burden upon him, and that if he should fail to do his duty in this respect, he would incur the displeasure of the Lord. I have never regarded this judgment his judgment infallible, nor his words inspired, but I have ever believed him better qualified for this work than any other one of our preachers because of his long experience, and because I have seen that he was especially called and adapted to the work, and also because in many cases where persons had risen up against his reproofs, I have been shown that he was right in his judgment in, uh, of matters and, uh, and in his manner of reproving. For the past 20 years, those who have been reproved and their sympathizers have indulged in an accusing spirit toward my husband, which, was worn, which has worn upon him more than any one of the other cruel burdens 
he has unjustly borne. And when he fell beneath his burdens, many of those who had reproved rejoiced. And from a mistaken idea of my view of his case, December uh, 25th, 1865, were much comforted with the thought that the Lord at that time reproved him for, quote, cutting and slashing. This is all a mistake. I saw no such thing. That my brethren may know that I did see the case of my husband, I give the following. I wrote and handed him the next day after the vision. Mm. So cutting and slashing, a lot of people say that as an ace card to throw down when they don't want to deal with the reproofs. And it happened to James White as well. Cody, something that I, I see repeating itself in these, in these quotes from Ellen White, in these references in scripture, they were always done, the reproof, the name calling, uh, however you want to cut it, uh, they were always done to, to save a person from the destructive course or destructive teaching that they were promoting. Right. That, that to was, save. To save. It was time. to save. It, yes. It was to save them, to bring them back before they would go over the precipice. And I look at the work that, that we have been doing here at Truth Triumphant for the last 30 odd years and I know in my heart of hearts it has never been our intention to in any way personally hurt anybody but it has been called to save and to continue on to see the prosperity and the preservation of the truth of God in this earth in the light of this avalanche of ecumenism that is leveling all the churches, including the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Absolutely. So uh, that, that's why we do it here at Truth Triumphant. That is why we will continue to do it. That is why we will name drop and will never stop name dropping because our desire is not to water down the message, but to save and to warn people who are heading toward the precipice. And Seventh-day Adventism today, Cody, is heading to the precipice. Uh, the ecumenical movement is leveling Seventh-day Adventism. Seventh-day Adventism is being struck by a plague today they don't even know it. And if anybody dares to wake them up, they're name calling. Well, Cody, we love, we love Seventh-day Adventists. We love the truths that have been given to Seventh-day Adventists. And if we see anybody in a public forum seeking to hurt and destroy the prosperity of the three angels' messages, we will name call and Absolutely. we will rebuke that by the grace of God. Absolutely. And just to, just to caveat off that, Truth Triumphant Ministries is not a ministry that's out there. We're not looking for people that are teaching error and dogpiling them. You <laughs> need to understand that. The stuff that Walter has been doing, the stuff that Doug's been doing, the stuff that uh, Pastor Ivor Myers and all the other names that we've listed that they've been doing. They've been doing this for years. They're, they've been given space. They've been rebuked. They've been, they've been emailed by other people. And it's come to a head now at this point where it really has to be brought out. And we will continue to name names to the glory of God. We will continue to name names. Because if, if these people who are off into one of these camps of apostasy, if they hear this message and they decide that they want to change course for the glory of God, they're going to be thanking us for giving the reproof. Amen. They're not going to be thanking the people that said, oh, you shouldn't talk about my idol like that. They're not going to be thanking them because those people would have, would have coddled them all the way to hell. Mm -hmm. So last question, Pastor Hughes. What's more important, the correct doctrine or hurt feelings? And where is the proper, where do we find the proper balance? 
Cody, the goal, the, the focal point of any, of any faithful Seventh-day Adventist, be it layman or leader, the goal of every faithful Seventh-day Adventist should be the prosperity, the promotion, and the exaltation of the greatest messages ever given to a group of people. And those messages are found in Revelation chapter 14. Amen. Every Seventh-day Adventist, that should be their whole goal, is to see those messages exalted, promoted, and prosper throughout the earth. That so many people could be in the kingdom of God as a result of their surrendering to those messages as they are in Christ Jesus. If somebody is not promoting those messages, if somebody is trying to hurt those messages, then every Seventh-day Adventist should stand up regardless if feelings are hurt. Yes. Regardless if somebody is offended because the truth of God and the messages of God are more important than anything else on this earth. Amen. Amen. We'll close with this. This is a quote from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3 as well, page 267, a final warning and probably um, our most powerful quote presented today. Who are standing in the council of God at this time? Is it those who virtually excuse wrongs among the professed people of God and who murmur in their hearts, if not openly, against those who would reprove sin? Is it those who take their stand against them and sympathize with those who commit wrong? No, indeed. Unless they repent and leave the work of Satan in oppressing those who have the burden of the work and in holding up the hands of the sinners of Zion, they will never receive the mark of God's sealing approval. They will fall in the general destruction of the wicked, represented by the work of the five men bearing slaughter weapons. Mark this point with care. Those who receive the pure mark of truth, wrought in them by the power of the Holy Ghost, represented by a man, mark by the man in linen, are those that sigh and cry for the abominations that be done in the church. Their love for purity and the honor and glory of God is such, and they have so clear a view of the exceeding sinfulness of sin that they are represented as being in agony, even sighing and crying. Read the ninth chapter of Ezekiel. We all have our decisions to make. Will we uphold the hands of the sinners in Zion and murmur against those who have the burden of the work upon them? Or will we stand by God and by those who are reproving sin and stand against the apostasy, regardless of hurt feelings, offended people, and regardless of where it comes from? Amen. Do you have anything else to add? No, Can you close sir. us out in prayer, please? Dear Father in heaven, we pray that those who have been name called, those that have been reproved, we pray that they would repent of their false teachings. Yes. That they would repent of the, the wrong impressions that they are leaving on millions of minds. The Ted Wilsons, the Walter Weiss, the Doug Batchelors, the, the Mark Finley's 3ABN, uh, Ivor Myers, and all the rest of these guys. Steve Wolbert, Father, we pray again for the Holy Spirit to go to those men to awaken them, to alert them to the wrongs that they have communicated and done to your people that are destroying your people. Please help them to turn around yes. before it's too late for them 
and for those who they have misled. Please turn them around, Lord, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.